Well, it's a real joy and a privilege to be sharing here with you this morning. Hopefully, all of the kids grabbed, we had a special kids bulletin for you on our way in. If you didn't and you want to go try and get one at the back, you're welcome to do that. There's a fill in the blank for the kids that you may do as you listen to the sermon if you would like. Sheep are helpless animals who need a shepherd. There are many things that can happen to a sheep without a shepherd. Without a shepherd, a sheep can get injured by falling in a hole or getting caught in a thicket. A sheep can get attacked by a wild animal, such as a wolf or a lion. A sheep could get stolen by a thief or a robber. Sheep need a shepherd to protect them from these things. They also need a shepherd to help them find the right pasture, to help them find shelter, to help them when they give birth, and to give them medication if they are sick, and to help them if they are tired. Sheep are pretty helpless on their own. The Bible says that we are like sheep and that we also need a shepherd. We need a shepherd because like sheep, we are helpless on our own and we cannot save ourselves. After God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden and put them in charge of everything. There was just one thing he told them not to do. He said, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So what do Adam and Eve do? They eat from the tree, which meant that they thought they could live life on their own without God's help. And because Adam and Eve made the choice not to listen to God, the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned. We all do the same thing as them thinking that we can live apart from God, that we can be in charge of our own lives. The consequence of sin is death. Although Adam and Eve did not die a physical death right away, they felt the consequence of their sin immediately. They felt shame and guilt, and they tried to hide from God. They knew that what they had done was wrong and that their relationship with God had changed. There was nothing Adam and Eve could do to change this. They were helpless, just like a sheep. They couldn't take back what they had done. The consequences of their sin were irreversible. Have you ever wished that you could take back something that you said or did? I remember a time like that from when I was a kid. I went to a really small elementary school in Ontario. This is a picture of my school up on the slide. There were only about six girls in my grade. And because the school was so small, we got to know each other really well, and usually we would all play together at recess. I remember one day at school, the other girls in my class had decided that they didn't like this one girl for some reason. They were mad at her, and they began teasing her and saying mean things. I didn't want to be mean to this girl because we were all friends. But it was either join in with the group or be left out on my own, so I went along with the group. I knew that what I was doing was wrong, and I felt horrible about it. I remember walking into French class after lunch, and the girl that everyone had been picking on started crying and told the teacher what was happening. Pretty soon, several girls were crying, including me. We apologized to the girl, and eventually things went back to normal. But we really hurt that girl's feelings that day, and I still remember how that felt. We couldn't take back what we had done to her. We all had to face the consequences for our actions. I felt guilt and shame for what I had done. It was the same for Adam and Eve. They felt shame and guilt for what they had done, but they couldn't take it back. They had to face the consequences of their decision. Like sheep need a shepherd, they needed someone to save them from their helpless situation, from the consequences of sin, which was death. Today we're going to be looking at the story of the good shepherd, which if you have your Bibles, you can find it in John chapter 10. And instead of reading the story today, we're going to watch a video of the story of the good shepherd. I tell you the solemn truth. The one who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door 
is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own sheep out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, I tell you the solemn truth, I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and he will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not a shepherd and does not own sheep sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep, he runs away. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. The Good Shepherd cares for and protects his sheep. The Good Shepherd will even lay down his life for his sheep. The opposite of a Good Shepherd is a thief and a robber. Thieves and robbers were very common in Jesus' day. They were dangerous and sometimes even murdered their victims. They were generally feared and hated. Thieves and robbers came to bring harm to the sheep, sometimes even killing them. They were more interested in fleecing the sheep, which means taking the wool and selling it, than in protecting and caring for them. John's primary audience for this passage was the Jewish people. And they would have understood that when Jesus was talking about the thieves and robber, robbers, he was talking specifically about the Jewish leaders, and in particular the Pharisees. In chapter 9, right before Jesus tells this story, the Pharisees were angry with Jesus for healing a blind man on the Sabbath. They were angry because Jesus was doing work on the Sabbath by healing the blind man. They were also angry because only someone sent by God would be able to heal a blind man. And the Pharisees did not want to believe that Jesus was sent by God. Instead of hearing Jesus' claims and recognizing him as God's son, they made fun of the blind man and sent him away. Jesus says that the Pharisees are spiritually blind. The Pharisees are acting like thieves and robbers because they reject Jesus and try to pe lead people away from Jesus, the one who can save them. This stands in sharp contrast to the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep so well that he calls them by name, and his sheep recognize his voice and follow him out to pasture. Some shepherds at this time would actually name their sheep, especially the shepherds with smaller herds. They assigned names according to things like shape and color. Shepherds in the Near East also led their sheep from out front instead of driving them from behind. They would go out in front of the sheep and call them, and the sheep would follow. We're going to watch a short video now that demonstrates sheep recognizing their shepherd's voice. Yeah. 
Those who have heard God's word and have responded in trust are part of his flock, and they will, list, they will not listen to anyone else. No more than a sheep will listen to a stranger, as we saw in that video. The Pharisees did not understand what Jesus was telling them, so Jesus explains it for them, starting in verse 7. Jesus says that he is the gate or door for the sheep, and he is the good shepherd. When sheep were brought into a village at night, they would be kept in a family courtyard that would have walls, stone walls, that were over two meters high, similar to the walls in this picture on the slide. There would be a heavy door in the stone wall that would open onto the street. Thieves would have to climb in over the wall to get at the sheep. When sheep stayed overnight in the open pasture, which was usually in the summer, they would be kept in an enclosure made of stone walls with briars on top, similar to the one in the second picture. This type of enclosure had no door. The shepherd would sleep in the opening, himself acting as the door or gate. Whether Jesus is referring to himself as the door or gate or the shepherd, the meaning is the same. He is the one who cares for, protects, and watches over the sheep. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. This stands in sharp contrast to the thief who has to sneak over the wall and comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Anyone who tries to offer a good and better life, apart from what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross, to remove our guilt and make us right with God is a deceiver, a thief, who is keeping people from the salvation that might otherwise be theirs. By his love, through which Jesus sacrifices himself by dying on the cross, Jesus rescues his flock from evil and death and leads them to the best pasture where they can enjoy a rich and full life. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This refers to a fullness of life that is eternal, which means it will carry on forever. But it also refers to a new quality of life that we can have right now, one where there is peace and wholeness. There is only one way to receive abundant eternal life, only one way to know God and have a personal relationship with him through Jesus alone. The hired hand is someone outside the family who is hired to take care of the sheep. The hired hand is willing to work and receive their pay. But when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, when there is danger to himself, he flees. This stands in contrast to the good shepherd who stays and faces the wolf, willing to risk his life for the sake of the sheep. This is what makes a shepherd good. A good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The shepherd stays because he cares about the sheep, and the sheep are worth something to him and his family. In the same way, Jesus' death is what makes him the good shepherd. Jesus' death is a sacrifice to save the sheep. The sheep are in danger, and he dies to save them. Like the good shepherd, Jesus does this because he cares about his sheep. We are worth a lot to him. We were our worth dying to protect, to save. Because of sin, we deserve death, an eternal separation from God. Jesus dies to save us, to take our punishment in our place, and to give us abundant, eternal life. This sacrifice is for everyone who recognizes his voice and chooses to follow him. Some people sometimes wonder, well, what about all the rules and laws in the Bible that Christians must follow? Don't they require me to do something to be saved? I was a camp counselor one summer at Keats Camps, and I remember one night after all the other kids had gone to bed, this little eight-year-old girl came out to talk with me. She had a notepad and a pen in her hand. 
She told me that she wanted to be a Christian. And she was ready to write down a list of all the things that she needed to do to be a Christian. I was happy to be able to tell her that she could put her notebook down. She wouldn't need it. There wasn't a list of things she needed to do to become a Christian. All she needed to do was to pray and accept God's gift of salvation. Did you know that God gave the Israelites the laws in the Old Testament to teach them that the law couldn't save them? The purpose of the law is to teach them right from wrong, to show them that they will never be able to keep the law perfectly on their own, and to point them to their need for a savior. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. We can't be saved by keeping the law. Why? Because we are helpless sheep. We are born in sin, which is a way of thinking, feeling, and acting that is all about me. And that goes against God's design for me. And that hurts others. We cannot be good enough on our own. We need a shepherd. We need someone to save us. I remember my mom telling me a story about when I was young and I had first learned how to unbuckle my car seat. That is a picture of me when I was younger. And I know I'm very cute. <laughs> yeah. But what you can't see in that cute picture is that I also had a stubborn streak. And I decided that I no longer needed to be buckled into my car seat. And when we were in the middle of driving down the road, I would unbuckle my car seat. And my dad would pull the car over, and he would get out and buckle me back in, and I would get very upset. He said they actually used to call me Houdini, because sometimes before my dad had even got back into his seat to start driving again, I would already have my seat belt unbuckled again. It was very frustrating for them. <laughs> my parents were only trying to protect me, but I didn't care. I thought I knew what I needed in that moment. And I think this is just a little taste of how God feels when we sin. When we decide that we know what's best. When we disobey God, we are a lot, a lot like a toddler with a wise, all-knowing parent standing right next to us telling us that what we are doing is not good for us, and yet we decide to go ahead and do it anyway. The consequences are painful. Just as the consequences could have been for me if my parents did not pull the car over and buckle me back in. Jesus is the good shepherd because he lays down his life for us. And laying down his life for us, he is taking the punishment that is due us for our sin when we choose to follow him as our good shepherd, when we listen to his voice, God looks at us and he no longer sees our sin. He sees that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for our sin and he declares us righteous, which means simply that we are right before God and he puts his spirit in us and he gives us abundant eternal life. The good shepherd gives you abundant life. Verse 10 says, the thief has come only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus longs to give you life to the full. All we have to do is choose to follow him, to listen to his voice. And how do we do that? We pray. We talk to him. We confess our sin. We say sorry for all the times we tried to go our own way. And we accept his forgiveness through Jesus' death on the cross. And we begin a relationship with him. We begin to read and study his word, the Bible. We get to know him. We get together with our care group every Wednesday. And we have a variety of kids of different ages in our group. And it never ceases to amaze me that amidst of all the chaos and loud noises going on, when a kid starts crying, Parents know immediately whether or not it is their child. One of the closest relationships in our culture is that of a child and a parent. And a parent is so attuned to their child that they can pick out their child's voice or their child's cry from the other voices around them. This is the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. 
that we are so attuned to the sound of God's voice or to the truth of God's word that we can pick them out among all the other things in our culture that compete for our attention and our allegiance. We can listen to something and know right away whether or not it is Jesus speaking to us or calling us to do something. Jesus is the good shepherd and he longs to give us abundant life, life to the full. This does not mean a life where we are always happy and nothing bad ever happens to us. This means a life where we are content because we are resting in God's goodness, because we have the hope of eternal life. God gives us a reason and a purpose for living. We live for him, to love him, to be in a relationship with him, and to love those around us. It is out of this desire to live for him that we do good works, that we try to keep the commands he gives us in the Bible. We don't do it to earn our salvation. We do it because we love God and we want to follow him as our good shepherd. What he gives us in return is abundant life, life to the full. If you have never chosen to follow Jesus, the good shepherd, if you have never responded to his voice and accepted his gift of forgiveness and abundant life, then I would like you to in invite you to do that today. If that is something you would like to do, then please come up at the end of the service and we would love to pray with you and talk with you and answer any questions that you might have.